Hello there everyone and welcome to another episode of the PowerShell video series. We are so close to the end of the series now. It's almost sad, isn't it? Eh, not really. Anyway, I hope you're looking forward to the series finale, where we're going to make a graphical app with buttons and everything on it. It's going to be pretty fun. For now though, in this video, I'm going to cover some important types that you need to know about and how we can work with them. So let's get started. <laughs> Now, I want to ask you a question. Let's say you want to make an object that represents a number, right? So, an object that tells you about a number. What properties would you put in it? Really, what properties would you put in it? What are the smaller parts you would make a number object out of? Maybe a bunch of byte properties? But then, how would you make a byte object to put in those properties? A bunch of bool properties to represent each bit? But then, how would you make a bool object? You can't. And doing all this property stuff isn't very practical either. Numbers and booleans are just so fundamental you physically cannot make them using properties. Almost everything else in the world you can represent with properties because everything else can be broken up into smaller parts accurately. But once you start looking at what those smaller parts are made of, and then what the smaller parts of those smaller parts are made of, and then the smaller parts within that and so on, at some point, you have to hit an end, and that end is what we call primitives. Primitives are extremely special types of objects, and there are very few of these that are so fundamental and basic, they aren't made out of properties. Now, remember this diagram here, showing all the different parts that PowerShell is made up of? Almost every type we use is from these sections. A lot of them are made in .NET, and PowerShell then adds in some of its own to represent commands and all sorts, and some modules can then add their own custom types if they want to, and so on. And every single one of those types are made up of smaller properties, of smaller parts. That's how they're made. However, primitive objects are made inside the CLR. If you remember all the way back from episode 2, the CLR is essentially the core of .NET. It's the thing that makes everything fundamentally work. The whole object system, the concept of methods and of properties and all of that, comes from the CLR. It's that core, fundamental thing that makes everything work. And .NET is the thing that then gives us thousands of types on top of that to help us do all sorts of things. However, primitive types are created by the CLR. Because they're so fundamental, they're treated very specially inside the CLR, so they can work as we'd expect. They aren't made up of properties, they are just on their own objects. So what are these special primitive types then? The special types that are created and treated specially by the CLR are numbers, booleans, strings, arrays, and one or two other things you'll never encounter. And that's it. These are the only fundamental building blocks that can't be broken up that well into properties. Everything else is made up of smaller objects in some way. So, how about we make our way through these primitives and take a look at them closer and how we can work with them. First, let's start with numbers. Now, there are actually quite a few types of number objects. The most important one is int, aka int32. Unfortunately, some of these primitive objects are so special they kind of have two names. This is the number object you will see 95% of the time. It's a whole number, and it takes up 32 bits, 4 bytes, in memory. And that's all there is to it. However, because it's only 4 bytes big, it can't store anything below or above 2 billion. So if you're doing something insane enough to need a number above that, then there's long, aka int 64. And this is 64 bits, 8 bytes, big. And you'd have to be doing some seriously insane stuff to go beyond the absolutely gigantic limit 8 bytes can store. There's also an 8-bit one and a 16-bit one, called byte and short respectively. But honestly, you really don't need to worry about those too much. And there's also a variant of all four of these that's to do with whether they can store negative numbers or not. So in total, there are 8 whole number object. Again though, no, I wouldn't worry about all these extra ones, you really don't need to worry about them. You will almost always be working with int, and maybe in some very extreme situations, long. And that's all you need to worry about. And if a method ever returns a byte or short, 
as soon as you do something to it, it literally just automatically casts itself to an inch. So you just don't need to worry about them. Alright, so that's all the whole number objects. Just before we move on to booleans, however, we're not quite done with numbers, because don't forget, there are also decimal numbers. And decimal numbers are quite a bit simpler. There are floats, aka singles, and doubles, aka doubles. Floats are 32 bits big, and doubles are 64 bits big. And because they're bigger, doubles are able to be more precise than floats, being able to handle a lot more decimal places before rounding. And there's technically also a third type, called decimal, that's 128 bits and even more precise, but it's not really a primitive. This is actually just made in .NET, and it's made up of some int properties inside that it uses in some clever ways. Alright, that's great. So now that we know about these types, let's hop into PowerShell and play about with these types, shall we? So making an integer in PowerShell is quite straightforward, as we already know. We can set num to free, and now num has the integer object in it. And we can also do decimal numbers too, and you'll see that this variable has the type double. Alright, so that's how we make numbers, how about doing some maths on them? When I want to add something to a number, I can use plus, just like you would in maths. So if I do num plus 2, and I run this, you'll notice that we get 5, because it took what's in num, which was 3, and then added 2 to it, and that's why we got 5. One really important thing to note here though, is num hasn't actually changed. If we look at num, it still contains 3. This here gave us back a new int, with the added number in it. If I want to actually save the result from this back into the variable, then I can write num equals num plus 2. So it takes what's in num, adds 2 to it, and then saves the result from that back into the variable. And that's how we can add to our variables. We can also subtract multiply, and divide, and we can even do modular division using percent, which is basically where we get the remainder of a division. Now, writing this whole thing out every time you want to add to a variable is a tiny bit of a pain, which is why there's actually a short way of writing it. You can write num plus equals 2, and this is a short way for doing all this. These two are technically identical, this is just a nicer way of doing it. Alright, that's enough about numbers, let's move on to booleans. A boolean is either true, or it's false. And the way we get the true object, or the false object, is by using some variables PowerShell has already set for us. If we want to get the boolean object true, we can write dollars true. And if we want to get the boolean object false, we can write dollars false. Alright, great, so that's integers and booleans, the two primitives. And the way we can know for certain that these are primitive types, is there's actually a property on the type object called isPrimitive. And that's true if the type is a primitive, and false is not. So if I want to find out if the boolean type is considered a primitive or not, I can simply take the type object for bool, that's the name of the type, and take this and ask isPrimitive using that property on the type object, and we can see that this property is true. It's actually a boolean property with true or false in it, depending on whether the type is a primitive or not. Alright, great, so that's the absolute fundamental primitive. Those are the types that are actually created in the CLI. Numbers and booleans, so essential to PowerShell. Just before we move on to strings, there's just one more thing I'd like to mention. There is technically one more number type I haven't mentioned, and that's called char which is short for character. This represents one single character inside a string, like the character A or something. I won't go into why this is considered a number type, it's basically to do with how characters are actually just numbers in the computer. Anyway, this doesn't have a special way of creating it. If you really wanted to make one, the best way is to actually take a string with just one character in it, and then cast it to a char. And there you go, there's your single character. Anyway, let's move on to strings. Now, one thing to note is strings aren't actually considered to be primitive types per se. The type object will actually say false on the isPrimitive property. But they are still a very important type, and they're technically still treated very specially by the CLR as well. So that's why I'm including it in here. Same goes for arrays, which we'll get to soon. To make a string, you can either write single quotes, or double quotes, and put the text you want in those. But there is actually a difference between these two, and I'll get to that in a second. Now, when you have a string, there's a lot of things you can do. If we use getMember on it, we can see that there's actually a whole load of methods. 
And surprisingly, there's actually one property here too, called length. This is the only property in here. The actual text data itself is handled by special treatment in the CLR, so that doesn't have a property to match. Anyway, this property here tells us how long the string is. So this string here is three characters long, so if I do dot length on it, we'll get three. Now, I mentioned earlier that there's a difference between single quotes and double quotes. What is that difference? Well, here's the thing. When you have single quotes, everything you write inside these quotes are treated exactly as they are. So if I write ABC in here, the string I get out of this will have ABC in it. If I write something like this, the string will contain exactly this in it. Fair enough. The only exception to this is if I try to put a single quote inside the string. The problem here is when PowerShell sees this quote we're trying to put in the string, it thinks we're trying to mark the end of the string. Because that's how you create strings, you have an opening quote and a closing quote. So when I try to put my single quote into the string here, it thinks I'm trying to close off the string. But that's not actually what we're trying to do. We just want to put a quote inside the string. To fix this, all we have to do is write the single quote twice. When PowerShell sees two single quotes straight after another with no space or anything, and it's inside a string, it understands that that means that no, I'm not trying to mark the end of the string, I'm just asking for a single quote to be put in there. So now if we look, I've got a single quote in my string. A lot of programming languages do something very similar to this. Anyway, yeah, besides that, what you write inside a single quote string is what you get. And double quotes are almost the same. And since you close them off with double quotes, you can put single quotes inside double quote strings without problems. But if you try to put double quotes in your string, you have to put two again so it works. But besides that, they are almost identical to single quotes with one exception. Double quotes have a certain very useful feature. When we have double quotes, we are able to embed the values of certain variables or expressions within the string. Let me explain what that actually means. So here I have a variable called i with the integer 3 in it. When we make a string with double quotes, we can do something very useful. If we write dollars $i inside the string quotes here, it will take what's in i and it will put it here, just like this. Let's say I have a variable called age and I put 500 in there. And what I want to do is I want to make a string that says I am whatever's in the age variable years old. To do that, what I can do is write double quotes and write I am and then dollars age and then years old. And when I run this, you'll notice that it replaces the dollars age here for what's in the variable. Single quotes don't do that. They just give you a string with exactly what you enter. So if I do this with single quotes, you'll see that the string I get literally has dollars age in it, exactly what I wrote. But with double quotes, it knows that if I have a dollar sign before some name, that it should substitute that with what's in the variable with that name. There's also one other thing you can do with double quotes. If you write dollar sign followed by brackets like this, then you can put whatever you want inside these brackets. So I can do all kinds of stuff like age plus 5, and now it puts whatever age plus 5 gives me in there. I can put absolutely whatever I want into these brackets. Alright, great. There's also one other thing I'd like to mention about strings right now. You can also add to the end of strings using plus. Let's say I have this string here, and I want to add a period to the end of this string. I can take the string and do plus a string with a dot. So I'm taking my string and I'm adding the string with a dot to it. So when I do this, you'll see that it gives me the string I had in str, but with the dot joined on. And I can join whatever I want onto the end. I can join numbers on the end, and you'll see that works just as you'd expect. However, one thing that's important to be aware of is just like numbers, Doing this plus here makes a new string with the thing joined onto the end. It doesn't change the str variable. This makes a whole new string with the dot added to the end. If we look at str, you can see it's still the same. So, just like with numbers, if I want to make this change make its way back into the str variable, I can do this. I take what's in str, add the dot to the end, and then take that new string and put it back into the variable, just like with numbers. And, also like numbers, there's a short form for doing this too. We can do plus equals dot to do it in a nice and short form. Awesome. 
Alright, now we only have one more thing left. We're getting through these. Now, what's interesting about arrays is there's actually a certain other type in this list that is basically an array. It's just got a different name. And that type is string. Strings are basically arrays. The way we create a string, using the single quotes and double quotes and stuff, is different from an array, but just about everything else beyond that is about the same. But let's not get ahead of ourselves here. What is an array? Well, quite simply, an array lets us put a bunch of objects together into one. It's basically a list of smaller objects put together. Let me give you an example. Let's say I have a variable called names, and in this variable, what I want to do is store a list of names for all the people who are allowed to watch AB Media videos. Well, we can use an array to do that. What I could do to hold this list of names is make an array, and inside that array, I put in all the strings. So here, I've added four strings to the array. There are now four strings in the variable, and these people are allowed to view AB Media. That's what an array is. It's a collection of lots of smaller objects. However many objects you want. We've actually been using arrays the whole time without even realizing it. For example, get process, right? That gives us more than one process object, doesn't it? Well, how does it do that? It gives us an array containing all the processes in it. That's how get process gives us back more than one process. ls gives us more than one object. Again, an array. Almost every command we've used this entire time that gives more than one object has actually been giving us arrays. Now then, let's hop into PowerShell and take a look at how we can create arrays. Just before we do that, however, I just want to look at something else really quickly. Now, all of the objects we've seen in this video have their own special ways of being made, right? So if I want to make a number, I just write the number. And if I want to make a string, I just use single quotes or double quotes. And if I want to make a boolean, I just use the two variables already pre-provided. If I want to make a type object based on a name, I write square brackets and put the type name in there. All these objects have their own dedicated syntax, dedicated things we can write to create them, because these types are so essential. However, what about all the other thousands of types of objects out there? For example, say I wanted to make a new file info object by hand, how would I do it? Or let's say I wanted to make a new date time object myself. These aren't primitives or extremely important, so they don't get the same special format that these types get. Well, let me show you how. To do it, what we can do is write this, and it will look a little odd, but I'm going to explain what exactly this writing means in the next episode. Let's say we want to make a new, I don't know, string builder type of object. Don't worry about what string builder actually does, it's just a random type I picked. To do that, we first need to get the type for string builder. Now, as I mentioned in the last episode, you need to write the full name to get most types. And the full name for string builder is system.text.stringbuilder. That's the full name of it, and we're going to write that in square brackets. And then, we write this, and this is the new thing we haven't seen before. We write two colons, followed by new. Again, I'll cover what these two colons are in the next video. It's actually the very last piece of the puzzle we're missing when it comes to the object system. But anyway, this new here is actually a method, and we want to call it. So, we simply put brackets after to call it, and when we call this method, it will create a new string builder object. And there it is, a brand new string builder. So I could just put that into a variable like so. So that's cool. And that's how you can create any object of any type. However, this isn't quite all there is to it. Because some types want you to give them parameters when you make them. They want you to put parameters into this new here. If we want to make a new date time type of object, which you can actually go without the full name on that one, and say new here and try to call it, we'll see that we get this error from the last episode. It can't find an overload of new that takes in zero parameters. So, let's look at all the overloads, which we can do simply by dropping the brackets. And we can see that, ah, when it comes to a date time, these are all the ways we can make one. And we can pick one, like let's say this one. We provide a year, and then a month, and then a day. So, we'll call new, and in the brackets provide the year, then month, then day. And there you go, it created a new date time object with those things. And since we didn't do anything with it, it just printed it out. There's also one more thing you need to know about creating objects. 
If an object doesn't have an overload of new with no parameters, and none of the overloads are any good to you, or if there's no overloads of new at all, which can happen, some objects won't have any overloads, there is one more thing you can do to create it. There's a command that will let you create a new object of the given type. What do you think that command's called? A command that makes a new object based on the type. Well, it's called new object and we simply give it the type's name. So remember how date time didn't have an overload of new with no parameters? Well, with new object, we can create it without providing those parameters. So if new doesn't work for you, this is something else you can fall back to that may work to create that object. However, if this command doesn't work either, then you just can't create that object. It's just not designed for you to make it, and it's probably designed to be created by something else. Types that you can't make yourself are quite rare, but they do exist. And if neither of these work for you, then that's what's going on here. You just can't make it yourself. It has to come from some command or some method elsewhere. Remember to always read the documentation about a certain type to find out how you're supposed to use it. Anyway, back to arrays. So an array is just a list of a bunch of objects. And to create it, we do this. We write an at sign and then rounded brackets and inside these brackets we give it a list of everything we want in the array separated by commas. So let's say I want to have a list of names. So I'm going to leave the name Alex which is a string, so in quotes. And then moving on to the next item, I also want to have Mike in there and John. Alright, there we are. So this is telling PowerShell to make a new array with these three strings in it. And if I hit enter, we can see that it made an array with those three things in it. And since we didn't do anything, it's just going to print out the array. Great, so that's how we make arrays. And each thing inside the array is called an item or an element. It's an item in the array. So let's take this here and put it into a variable. And I now have an array in this variable. And let's see what it says when I run get type. So we can see that the type is called, oh, this is interesting, object and then square brackets. What's this? Well, this is how you describe array types. When you have square brackets at the end of a type, that means it's an array. So in this case here, this is an array containing objects in it. Object basically means any type. Sometimes if you look at some methods or some properties, you might sometimes see things like int and then square brackets. This is an array that contains ints in it, it has integers only in it. In fact, if you look closely, we've actually seen this writing quite a few times throughout the series. Sometimes methods have had parameters that accept arrays, or have a return type that gives back arrays. Or sometimes the parameters on commands have been arrays too. For example, if we ask for help on the command import CSV, Take a look closely here. The path parameter on import CSV isn't actually a string. It's a string array, meaning we could give it multiple paths, multiple strings. The reason why, even though this is really taking in an array, we can still use import CSV like this without all the at stuff to make an array is PowerShell yet again automatically cast this one string here into an array with this one item in it. So that's why we're able to just give it the item without worrying about it. But if you want to give import CSV multiple paths, you can do that using this. Anyway, what things can we do when we have an array object? Well, for starters, we can write dot length. This gets a number telling us how many items the array has in it, just like strings. Hmm, we'll get to that in a moment. And if we want to get just one of the items on their own, we can take the array and write square brackets and put a number in here saying which item we want. Do we want the first item in the array, the second item and so on. Let's say I want the first item in the array. All I need to do is give it the number for the first item. Now, this number in the square brackets starts at zero, not one. So to get the first item, the first thing in the array, I write zero. So this says get me item number zero in the array. This number here starting at zero is something almost every programming language does. And .NET and PowerShell and C Sharp, they're no exception. They start arrays at zero. And there we are. It got just that first item out of the array, just like this. 
and if we want the second item in the array, I can do 1, and so on. This number here is called the index. Alex is at index 0 in the array. Mike is at index 1 in the array, and so on. Anyway, another thing I can do with arrays is pipe them into for each, which is actually what we've been doing this entire time anyway, so we're already very familiar with this. I can say something like, for each item, for each one of the strings in here, let's just, I don't know, add a dot to it. And this will run on each item, giving back the string with the dot added and putting them together. And so we'll get this, where each of them now have a dot on them. Nice. And believe it or not, for each gives back an array too. This here is an array. In fact, let me just prove that to you. I'm going to run get type on what for each gives back. Now, you might think, okay, I'll just dump get type at the end, but that's not going to work because PowerShell is going to get very confused because what PowerShell sees here is you're trying to get the type of the curly braces thing and then put that into for each, which is not what we're trying to do here. We're not trying to get the type of the script block here. We're trying to get the type the whole command gives back. So. To do what we actually want, we have to put the command in brackets, like this, and then do the dot get type after that. This tells PowerShell, run all of the stuff inside the brackets first, and then get the type of that. So now it actually understands us, and you can see that indeed, it gave back an array. So, the for each added a dot to each item in the array. What if I then wanted to put this back into the array, because the array hasn't been touched? Well, all I'll do is I'll take what this command gives us and put it back into array. And there we are. If I now look at what's in array, all the strings have dots on them. Now, one thing I said earlier is most commands give back arrays, right? So let me just prove that. I'm going to run get process and then call get type on what it gives back and see what it is. So, here's get process. And you might think I'll just dump get type at the end. But yet again, this confuses PowerShell because it thinks that the get type is supposed to be part of the command name or something. It, it just doesn't make any sense to it. So again, exactly the same thing. We're going to put the command in brackets. And again, this makes it clear to PowerShell. Ah, right, you want to take the command, treat it like it's this one single block, and then get the type of that. That's really what the brackets mean. They make whatever you put in them happen first and be treated like this single block, this single variable that you can then perform an action on. So anyway, we'll find that this gives back an array too. And no matter where you look, you'll probably find arrays everywhere. For example, remember the get properties method on type objects? This gives back an array containing all the properties. In fact, if we call this method and then run get type on what this method gives back, we can see that, yep, it gave back an array an array of property info objects describing properties. And another nice thing we can do now, if I want to get just one process on its own, based on its index, based on its position in this list, I can take what get process gives back and access index, let's say, zero. And this will give me the first process it gave back on its own. I've actually been doing this a lot throughout the series off camera. Every single time I said, let's say I have a process object here in this variable, this is how I got that one process object. Another thing I could do is run length to get how many processes it gave back. So we can see there's 188 processes running on my system. Windows, you have serious problems. But yeah, there were so many things I could do. Now, we're basically done with this video, but there's just one final thing I want to mention. I kept on mentioning earlier that arrays and strings are similar, and they are really similar. In fact, everything you can do on an array, you can do on a string. For example, if I have a string, and I want to get the second character in it, you know what? I'll just take my string, and do square brackets, and 1 in it. Remember, it starts at 0, so 1 is the second, and there's my character. And if we look at what type this gives us, we can see it's that char type from earlier. A string is basically, as far as we're concerned, an array of chars. That's literally what it is. An array of char objects. Here's another example. You can add to the end of strings using plus, right? Well, guess what? You can also do the same with arrays. Remember my array of names from earlier? Well, let's add a new person to this array. 
I'll use plus equals so I can add the person while also changing the original array. And I'll add Tom to the array. So now if we look at our array, we've got Tom in there. Hmm, but this Tom I just added, they don't have a dot, everyone else does. So how can we change this item that's already in the array to have a dot? Well, quite simply, all I'm going to do is I'm going to find what index it is. So let's see, 0, 1, 2, 3. Okay, so Tom is at index 3 in the array, position 3. And what I'm going to do is take index 3 in the array, so using the square brackets, I'm going to take this item at index 3, and I'm going to add a dot to it, like this. Add a dot to whatever that index 3 in my array. And now if we look at it, ah, that's better. They have a dot now. Good. So hopefully you can sort of see how it works, and how you use these things together to do much more complex things. There's all sorts of creative things you can do, as we'll start to see, especially in the next video, when we start to actually make some tools. With that said, I'll see you all in the next video. Bye.